let's pray together. Hmm. Indeed, Lord, it matters so much more when we are grateful under difficult circumstances. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the example of the Apostle Paul. And as we look to the word this day, Father, open our hearts. Help us to willingly set aside our stubbornness and to willingly, selflessly see you. In your name we pray, amen. We're looking at the book of Philemon, one of those long books, if you will. <laughs> and we'll be looking at the whole book. Don't worry, it's not that long. But we will look at, uh, it is page, let's see here, page 1184 in the Pew Bible. Nope, that's wrong, 1186. 1186 in the Pew Bible. One more time, this is the letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our fellow, beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me, in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness may not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The celebration of Thanksgiving, Pastor Alistair Begg observes, provides us with an opportunity to remind ourselves that every good and perfect gift comes to us from our Heavenly Father, who doesn't change like shifting shadows. I'm sure many of you can resonate that the circumstances surrounding every Thanksgiving holiday are different. I recall some years where my mom's big Demlo family would gather and we would share a huge feast. The cousins would play touch football while the adults were busy preparing the turkey and trimmings. Certain Thanksgivings, it's easy to express gratitude. But our lives in this fallen world are like shifting shadows. There was the Thanksgiving on Cape Cod that I'll never forget, when our two-month-old Autumn had her peak day of colic. Nothing seemed to diminish her pain that day. Nothing stopped her screaming. For April and I, it was difficult, at least more so, to express our joy when, frankly, we were just too exasperated to eat. But we did express our thanks, because God is greater than every circumstance. Our gratitude means more when doing so takes effort. When doing so 
takes effort. Even when community fails us, as it sometimes does, does even family, when things go wrong and we find ourselves down, there are so very many reasons to be thankful. Paul, amidst a challenging situation, sets an example for us all of being thankful in hard times. Expressing thanks does more than encourage. It humanizes children of God. Expressing thanks does more than encourage. It humanizes fellow children of God. Paul models that corporate and individual thankfulness is appropriate. While Paul certainly considered himself a prisoner for Christ, in the context of this letter to Philemon, he is literally a prisoner. Suffering in Rome at this time, Paul's circumstances are just as significant and no less trying than Onesimus. Prison conditions at that time were deplorable. They were filthy, and being largely underground, they were poorly ventilated. They were designed to psychologically and physically torture a prisoner into confessing a crime. It would be at least understandable if Paul had a hard time finding cause for thanksgiving. But is that what we find? Not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. One of my family pastimes was watching a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving and then, of course, a Charlie Brown Christmas around this time every year. There's actually a Peanuts cartoon once that showed Charlie Brown uh, giving Snoopy his dinner on Thanksgiving Day. And unfortunately for Snoopy, it was just his usual dog food. Snoopy looked at his bowl and said, this isn't fair. <laughs> the rest of the world today is eating turkey with all its trimmings. And all I get is dog food. Because I'm a dog, all I get is dog food. He stared at his food for a while, looking rather glum. And then he kind of smirked and said, I guess it could be worse. I could be a turkey. <laughs> Indeed, instead of focusing on the circumstances, Paul recognized a divine appointment was right in front of him. This slave turned brother Christian convert not only provided comfort to Paul, but set him on a mission where expressing gratitude was going to be a key. Now, as we read verses 4 to 7, you may have noticed that there is great, great similarity to Paul's thanksgiving in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 8. Listen closely to Colossians 1, verses 3 to 8. Notice the similarities. Paul writes, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. So did you hear some similarity? Yeah, well, let's look at two overarching insights between these two. First, Paul, the author of both of these letters, prayed with a thankful heart, and thus he fostered love for Philemon with prayers of thankfulness. How did he grow in his love for Philemon? Because he prayed with thanksgiving. As a mentor told me this wonderful insight, sometimes you are the answer to your prayers. Be the answer to your prayers for someone else. Thankfulness was embedded within him, regardless of circumstances. Second, that in his apostolic concern for the well-being of a whole church like the one in Colossae, Paul did not hesitate to also encourage and to see individuals. We see this in the building up of Epaphras as a witness in Colossae of his love. And it is of great emphasis here in the letter to Philemon. What further stands out is how Philemon comforted Paul in his afflictions. Not only had Philemon brought the apostle joy, but Paul amplifies this with the, using the adjective much or great. It was great joy to see and to be blessed by the news of Philemon. He even speaks of Philemon as an encouragement because of how Philemon had refreshed the saints 
using the word for the seed of emotions. As someone who genuinely cared for the church, Paul is thankful and confident that Philemon will now give great weight to what he will say next. Indeed, by expressing thanks, Paul humanizes Onesimus and defies slavery. Certainly, Philemon did it to himself by owning a slave. At the same time, Paul put him in a difficult situation. You see, in honor-oriented Greco-Roman society, slaves were economic property, executed at the whim of the head of household. And while male household slaves were generally treated better, Rebecca McLaughlin observes rightly how, according to Roman laws, Philemon could have branded Onesimus, deliberately broken his joints, or administered some other form of punishment because he had run away. Would Philemon set an example of Onesimus for other slaves in the vicinity, or would he do the Christ-honoring practice of extending mercy, right, and love, and seeing him as a person? You see, this was no small question as the church entered into the world and as it was penetrating cultures. Now, personally, we've had this conversation, Pastor Alex and I, of what draws us and makes a friend. And I would say in my experience, it has often been someone who stands out in the crowd, something like thoughtfulness and friendliness. One such person was a wealthy lawyer and and planter named Robert Carter III, who lived in 18th century Virginia. Now, I ask that you hear this whole thing out before you make a quick judgment. Now, Carter owned over 65,000 acres. He had 511 slaves when he was baptized as a new believer on September 6, 1778. And becoming a Christ follower stirred in him a major change, a total distaste for slavery. In his own words, in tolerating slavery, or excuse me, tolerating slavery shows great depravity, he wrote. Despite the resistance of his son-in-law, of various overseers and tenants, Carter authored a deed of gift that culminated in the freeing of every one of his 511 slaves. But here's the thing. He didn't just free them. In addition, he allowed these people to choose their last name so they could keep their families together and pass down wealth. He ensured that they were, had workable skills, arranged for them to buy or lease land, and bought their wares. He also spent a great deal on transporting them from his plantation to the courthouse and on lawyers to guarantee his heirs. I think the story of Robert Carter III is incredibly incredibly important, one descendant writes, to show, and this is key, how personal convictions can be stronger than the status quo. That doing the right thing is often hard, but it is important, and that people really matter that people are more important than the work that they perform. Now, his right in no ways negates slavery's wrong. But Carter shows that Christ has indeed the power to transform our hearts, to resist evil in our midst. We saw how Paul encouraged Philemon. Paul also encourages the one on whose behalf he writes this letter. In verses 10 to 13, Paul makes this plea. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Now, at first glance, we may not fully appreciate what Paul is implying here about Onesimus, but he is deliberately humanizing him. While in the Roman familia, he's no more than belligerent property, to Paul, Onesimus is a child. And even more, He's a son. Such a statement would certainly have caught Philemon's attention, but he even goes further. He talks of him as being his very heart. His very heart. Paul's words of affection for this runaway slave surpass any other expression of love for an individual in all of his writings. That's pretty astounding, though we who live on this side of Christ and are united to him know how this can be. The lesson is that in praising and valuing Onesimus, Paul defies the institution of slavery. And the lesson for us is that when we humanize, the world dehumanize, the world has dehumanized, but we are called to humanize. Brothers and sisters, myself included, if we are going to see victory over sex trafficking 
we must humanize those whom the world has dehumanized. If we are going to see victory over poverty, we must humanize those whom the world has dehumanized. And yes, if we are going to see victory over gender dysphoria, we must humanize and value both sexes as intrinsically valued and determined by God alone. And this we must do directly with truth and in love. Importantly, Paul's encouraging appeal is genuine. This statement stems from a question I thought about as I read this letter. And the question is, in what manner was Paul appealing to Philemon? Specifically, was Paul using flattery as a means of appealing to Philemon? Was Paul manipulating him? We've established that Paul deeply cared for both of these men as brothers in the Lord. Would such circumstances warrant deceit if it meant the betterment of one? Well, as we look at Paul's words, we should share in the conclusion that no, that the apostle was not in any way underhanded, nor was he deceitful. For one, as Gabe Nelson was sharing yesterday and mentioning the philosophy of Nietzsche, there was very little in it for Paul to free Onesimus. Empowerment could not have been his motivation nor selfish desire. But there are other hints as to the genuineness of this encouragement. For one, Paul is specific toward Philemon. Notice, Paul always thanks God for Philemon because, as the New Living Translation rightly translates, I continue to, I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Such statement stresses Philemon's consistent character. He had faith and he had love, right? In verse 6, Paul refers to Philemon's sharing of the faith using the word koinonia, this word is associated with fellowship, of participating in the lives of the faithful ones. Philemon practiced what we call the ministry of showing up. He went to church, but he didn't just show. He served the Lord, and he loved all of the saints, not just the ones he was comfortable with. He was an active, present, and pleasant member of the congregation. Some even suggest that he was the leader. Paul is thus recognizing here a specific gift that Philemon brought to the church body. The second thing that we see, that Paul is gentle toward Philemon. Consider, if you will, verses 8 and 9. He says, Though I am bold enough in Christ to com command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. The apostle indicates that he has the clout and the authority to speak freely with absolute confidence to Philemon. He's an apostle. He had that authority. He could tell him exactly what to do and expect it to be done. This noun often conveyed a note of unexpected boldness, very much like what we see repeatedly from Paul in 2 Corinthians. Such word choice was used by Paul only when the situation was most dire, was most serious, that it called for apostolic authority. But he doesn't do that. Now, he maybe gently reminds him he could, but he's also not. And so immediately we should ask, if Paul can speak so boldly, why doesn't he? And I think that question should sit on us, that rather than controlling the situation, Paul takes the godly approach of wooing, of persuading. Yes, maybe directly, but nevertheless, nevertheless with love. He is driven, he writes, by Christ-like agape love. All told, how can someone conclude that Paul used passive aggression at all in this letter? In an article titled The Honest Truth About Passive Aggress Aggressiveness, Pastor Stephen Whitmer, who's actually a kind of a local pastor actually, observes how the sins we speak are always speaking to us. They whisper promises to us, and that's why we say them. Passive aggressive speech promises to spare us direct conflict and to ensure a safe distance from our personal responsibilities. It promises that we can meet our own needs rather than serving others. And as a bonus, it also promises us self-righteousness. We can feel superior without any cost to ourselves and get away with it. But the promises are all lies because there's a great cost when we talk to each other this way. You see, to do so would have been contrary to the heart of genuineness the heart of thankfulness. For how can you place true value on someone that you are trying to manipulate? 
No, Paul's words of encouragement are genuine, as should our words be. Nothing turns us into bitter, selfish, dissatisfied people more quickly than an ungrateful heart. And nothing will do more to restore contentment and the joy of our salvation than being a people of thankfulness. I think I thank Pastor Alex for that reminder earlier. And our model for such things is none other than Jesus Christ. For in the final hours before hanging on that cross, Jesus, as you know, sat and ate with the 12 disciples and other disciples. And do you know what Jesus did before distributing that bread and wine? In Matthew 26, we read how of all things, our Lord gave thanks to the Father. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And to be honest, and I don't blame you if you have at times read through this as, well, he was, he was praying. Yes, but it's specific in his prayer, isn't it? That he was giving thanks. And what is he giving thanks for? What is he giving thanks for? He knew that soon enough he would be paying for the sins of all mankind with his own body and his own blood. But he also knew that it was there that he could finally say that it is finished. He gave thanks because the Father's will is that those whom he loves are to love one another and to love him. At the end of his life, John Wesley wrote a letter to politician, abolitionist William Wilberforce, and in it he wrote these words. Reading this morning a tract wrote by a poor African, I was particularly struck by the circumstance that a man who has a black skin, being wronged or outraged by a white man, can have no redress it being a law in all of our colonies that the oath of a black man against a white goes for nothing. What villainy is this? That he who has guided you from youth up may continue to strengthen you in this and in all things is the prayer of dear sir, your most affectionate servant, John Wesley. And yes, it took years and it was a fight, but eventually William Wilberforce drew the support necessary to end the slave trade in Great Britain. And personally, I'm very indebted and grateful for Frederick Douglass, a Massachusetts man who had been through slavery and who helped bring about emancipation here in the United States. Expressing, expressing thanks does more than encourage. It humanizes where there is dehumanization in our world. Let us pray. Father, we may think this old news, but the reality is, if we are listening and if we have our eyes attuned to our culture, there is dehumanizing going on all around us. Father, forgive us of these things. Help us to see that we are a people who are wonderfully and fearfully made. Help us to know that because of Jesus Christ, we are made useful. The name Onesimus means useful. And I don't believe it was an accident. I think it was Paul bringing up his dry sense of humor to say that that who was once useless has been made useful. Lord, thank you that you make us useful, that you make us new, that you change our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You know, I don't have any secret knowledge or any way of telling you with absolute assurance what Philemon did, but I'm pretty confident with the faith that God has granted to me that Philemon did the right thing, that he extended mercy to Onesimus, and that the church was all the better for it. You see, brothers and sisters, when we express thankfulness, when we see each other and we value each other as esteemed in the Lord, we do more than just simply encourage we humanize. And you never know what your brother or sister is going through, that that timely word may be the difference between life and death. Go in peace. Amen.